Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. And thank you for tuning in to Talking Books and Writing and Stuff, brought to you in part by the Rebel Typewriter Shop, based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, run by Tom Cholowski, who, as you know, recently received a typewritten letter from actor Tom Hanks. So Tom is big in the typewriter business. If you need typewriter things fixed or whatever, you give him a call. But anyway, today with us we have Jonathan Manthorpe. We're calling him in Victoria, B.C. He has a new book out. It's called Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and Pestilence, which seems to fit right in. But before we do that, Mr. Manthorpe, uh, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about your background. I know you were a foreign correspondent for a number of years. So where did you begin and how did you end up doing that as a job? (laughs) Yeah, well, I... uh, (laughs) um, I, I won't go over the whole 55 years of my career as a journalist, Dennis, uh, <laughs> but suffice, suffice to say, I, uh, I realized when I was at McGill in the, uh, in the early 60s that I was wasting my time doing political science and economics, that I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I actually went and trained in Britain, um, and they had a really good training scheme at that time. I uh, came back in 1969 and... Uh, battered down the door at the Globe and Mail and saw Clark Davey, who was then the managing editor, the finest managing editor I've worked for, I think, over the years, and persuaded him to give me a job. He he said he'd give me a week's trial, and that that sort of spewed into um, three months uh, probation. Uh, And uh, by the end of 1969, I was on staff first as as a rewrite uh, guy on the the desk, using an open-faced typewriter um open frame typewriter uh and um and then i did city hall for um uh or city desk for a a few months and then they uh, posted me to covering um ontario politics and i just loved it i fell in love with uh, political reporting and i did that for the globe for the next sort of six or seven years then i joined the toronto star to write a daily political column and then in the late 70s, I decided uh, to do something new. The London or uh, European Bureau was open, and I applied for it, and I got it. And that's when I started out as a foreign correspondent, first for the Star, then for Southern News, and then the Southern's various sort of new names all the way through to Post Media. And um, I retired from, from there in 2013, so uh, after having done Europe, Africa, and Asia. <laughs> and, and how does one, when you, a person is a foreign correspondent, mm. as they mm. used to call them, or still do, I guess, Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan Manthorpe is with us. Um, how do you do it? Do you have to establish contacts with people? Do you do yep. lots of yep. meetings and just gathering information somehow? Well, the first, the, I mean, I think the, the, the first thing that one really sort of figures out when you're a foreign correspondent is uh, the very basic thing about journalism, and that is that there is no substitute for going and seeing with your own eyes. You know, fundamentally, there are no really reliable secondhand sources of information, and particularly not when you're somewhere like Africa or Asia. Um, you know, you have to go and see for yourself. So I spend a heck of a lot of time finding ways to get into places where um, where the authorities, one way or another, didn't want me to go. Um, and uh, you you learn all sorts of tricks of getting across borders. You know which pilot will fly you in where for a you know thousand dollars U.S. folding money, um, which you always keep in your sock or somewhere because you never know when you're going to need need it to get you out of some hellhole. So it's um, uh, it's it's a bit of a a, a rat bag life. Um, uh, very it can be tough on the family. You know, I have wife and, and three sons, and um, um, you know you you have to think about them and uh, make sure that they're safe at home. Um, so it's um, it, it, it's a bit of an adventurous life, um, but uh, but you know that's what it takes to uh, to try and give um, readers or the audience in Canada or elsewhere reliable information about what's going on. And there literally is no 
there is no uh, substitute, in, particularly in foreign corresponding, for going to see for yourself. And, and it's anything that anybody else tells you about what's going on somewhere is, is, is very suspect. You have to go and see. So you can't just sit around and rewrite the government news releases and no, call it a day? <laughs> no, no, and often you can't even rewrite uh, the the uh, agency reports, um, you know, and the agencies are usually pretty good. We have Reuters and AP and Canadian Press and uh, uh, Deutsche Welle and, and people like that, but... Um, but I've known many situations where even they were, were way out to lunch. You have to go and see. You have to go and see for yourself. And this is Jonathan Manthorpe with us. He's got a new book out. It's from Cormorant Books. Now, are they based in Vancouver or Victoria? No, they're in Toronto. Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Well, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Spadina, Spadina Avenue. Spadina Avenue. Okay. Um, <laughs> the new one, Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and pestilence we're talking about yeah. right-wing crazies i guess or left-wing well, crazies i don't know <laughs> all sorts of crazies um it's basically a story about you know, you know in 1989 the 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 uh, collapse of the berlin wall the end of the cold war we all thought uh, or many of us thought that you know democracy had won that it, the game was game over democracy was the only game in town um and uh, for a while, it looked as though that might be the case. But, uh, but actually, of course, you know, we blew it in many ways. And we see a lot of um, the, uh, the destruction around us today from, from having assumed that, that it was game over. And we allowed all sorts of uh, um, uh, mistakes to occur amongst our politicians, not least of which, of course, was uh, that um, a huge gap began to appear between um, the sort of political establishment and the voters, which is still a, a major problem today. Most most uh, uh, voters in in all North Atlantic countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, Canada, the United States, Europe, uh, all of them democracies. Most voters don't have very little trust in their political leaders, and that's partly because uh, you know politicians have become a sort of professional class but really no longer remember why they are doing their job. Um, and they've lost touch with, uh, with many elements in society. And the result is, of course, you get populists coming in like Trump and like, um, uh, I guess, Boris Johnson in Britain and, uh, and like some of the other, in other countries of Europe, um, uh, in Hungary and in Poland. Um, and they give simple... Uh, uh, and and really unfeasible answers to to complicated questions and people will uh, say, well, that sounds like common sense. This guy seems to understand what's troubling me, and so they vote for them. Um, and it's it's uh, it's largely because a lot of our politicians have really lost touch with uh, with the people who who pay their their wages in the last uh, twenty thirty years. Now, would you say Canadian politicians are in that mold as well, or are we not yeah, quite not there as, yet? It's not, yeah, it's not as bad here as in some other countries. But, you know, we've got a pretty bad uh, um, democracy deficit here as well. Um, you know, the I mean, just look at the way, you know, Parliament... Um, uh, got canned immediately the uh, the pandemic um, appeared now you know to their credit the opposition parties insisted that parliament be recalled but you know we went through several months where um, our only contact with our political leadership was um, was uh, Justin Trudeau standing on his doorstep in the morning um, and uh, you know that's not a very healthy basis um, for a democracy, and, and thankfully that's now changed. But uh, but there was a bit of there was a bit of a of a hint there of I think of something that's happened, and that's been this sort of absolute focus not on the parties but on the leaders and on on the leaders' brand. And we've got this sort of celebrity culture going in politics, which is not healthy at all. I think we've we've got a lot of this from from the U.S., but it's it's uh, it's infected a lot of democracies and. Uh, the political parties, I think, are very much to blame for this. They, uh, they've, they've, many of them just see their role as winning elections. They, they've lost, uh, I think, sight of the fact that they are actually the front line of democracy, and they have, they have a, a, a responsibility to keep touch with, uh, with voters, to, um, to uh, listen to voters, uh, and uh, 
to foster democracy, to foster uh, participatory democracy, to foster um, conversations and discussions and debates at the local level. But they've given a lot of uh, politicians, they've given them, um, they've abrogated their duties to uh, polling organizations um, and also to the courts. You know, uh, the Supreme Court in Canada is much more popular uh, and, and has much more standing amongst the public than the politicians do. And that's partly because the politicians have abrogated a lot of their responsibilities to the court. And, uh, the, you know, the social issues that should be debated and discussed and decided in Parliament have been deciding, are being decided by the courts because the politicians have just abrogated their responsibility. So um, going back to your, your basic question, Dennis, you know, have we got a problem in Canada? Yes, we do. And, uh, and I think we... Uh, uh, we need we need to address it. We need to really start looking closely at the state of our of of, of our democratic def, def, deficiency in Canada. And we're talking with Jonathan Manthorpe, a new book out. It's called "Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and Pestilence." And it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of now. It's almost the political scene is looked on like a hockey game or a football game. Who won the debate? Who won this contest? Who lost that debate? And yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with policies at, at all. Well, no, you're quite, you're quite right. You're quite right, Dennis. I mean, that, that's, that's uh, um, uh, yeah, politics is, is being treated, particularly by the political organizers, in the, in the same sort of way as, as sport. Um, and it's winners, losers. Uh, and as with so many sports, you know, you don't, in the old days, there used to be some sort of sense of gamesmanship in sports, um, uh, where you, you always gave credit to, your, you know, to the loser, but uh, not anymore. I mean, sport seems to be a matter not only of winning, but also of humiliating your opponent, if you possibly can. And, and, and that has infected um, uh, politics as well. It's, it's part, I think, of this celebrity culture that, that has overtaken uh, the public life in general, and I, I, uh, I, I find it quite deplorable, and, and I'm very dangerous. I think, um, I, I think it's um, it's a very, very unhealthy uh, development. Uh, Jonathan Manthorpe is with us, talking about his new book, uh, "Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and Pestilence," and looking at some excerpts. One of the points you make, I think, is that our system here in Canada, starting 1867 imported from Britain, pretty much uh, wholesale. And yeah. you're thinking now that that uh, system doesn't quite suit our present realities. Am I right there? Well, I was, I, I was uh, discussing this issue because there, there, are, there are many sort of eminent people in Canada who have very different views on all this. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Sir John A., um, he he wanted a unitary state. He he didn't particularly want a confederation. Um, it was uh, the the desire for a confederation really came from the maritime provinces. Um, but we've never quite resolved how the relationship between the federal government and the provincial government should work, um, and that's been a problem now and again. Now, having said that, my own feeling is, and I've been close to this. Uh, uh, on some occasions, in the back in the early 1980s, I took a couple of years out of journalism and um, worked for Pierre Trudeau in London on patriation of the Constitution. I was part of a small team uh, he had there to help um, ease patriation through the British Parliament. So I, I had a lot to do with the provinces and provincial governments at that time. Um, I, we've sort of we've managed to. Uh, to find a sort of way of fudging the relationship between Ottawa and the provinces, but we don't really have any, you know, any settled, for example, amending formula. There are a lot of subjects which we don't sort of talk about in public because we know it'll it'll cause ructions in federal provincial relations. We've got a lot of bodies federal and provincial that sort of talk in the background behind the curtain and we never quite know what's going on um it's it's really never been resolved uh, as i say we have a functioning sort of system but it's but it's uh, it's very much a sort of canadian compromise it's nothing you could point at and say this is how federal provincial relations work um 
I suppose you know the the, the major benefit is that it, it it doesn't blow up terribly often. Uh, <laughs> when it does, of course, we get um, serious crises. But w- whether we anyone is prepared to really uh, open the Meech Lake can of worms <laughs> and say, "Come on, folks, it's time we really sorted this out." But you know, there are some things which are just absolutely stupid in this country uh for example you know a lawyer trained in toronto cannot practice in bc or in saskatchewan without going through a whole load of other courses and paying a lot of money to what basically is a is a is a local sort of legal mafia who um, who uh, put up all sorts of barriers to outsiders impinging on their territory without uh, without paying a lot of money and it's the same with doctors the same with engineers same with dentists i mean it's it's utterly, utterly fatuous that uh, here we are uh, you know a, a, a massive country of 36 million people or whatever and um, and we have all these internal boundaries and and tariffs and uh, it's just just dumb it really is i mean the, you know one of the first things we should do is try and if, if if we want uh, you know free trade with other countries, we we sure as hell ought to have free trade within Canada, and that includes you know professionals being able to move from one province to the other, um, you know, without uh, all sorts of penalties. Oh, right, you want uh, capital to move freely, so you want human capital to move freely as well, and it well, doesn't seem to work that way. Uh, on a personal well, note, my my brother-in-law is a welder in the oil patch. He's based Mm -hmm. in Alberta, but if he wants to cross the border in Lloydminster like it's two steps away, he has to fill out all these ridiculous forms to be able to work in Saskatchewan with exactly the same stuff that he does in Alberta, so... Right, right. You know, it's utter nonsense. It's well, nonsense. and heck, you know, I mean, at an even more sort of mundane level, you know, in, theoretically, I can't, uh, you know, pick up a few bottles of uh, of uh, single malt whiskey in uh, in Alberta and, and bring them back into BC. I mean, it's, oh, uh, I know. <laughs> that's that's crazy. Yeah, we can't get yeah. you know moosehead beer out here or something like that. That's right. Also the same, I was thinking about uh, professionals who immigrate, like doctors, yep. mechanic, engineers and stuff from another country. Yep. Like, to me, if a broken bone is a broken bone, no matter what country in the world you're in. Oh, there. And you I mean, there's some ridiculous stories. They could be there's trained. Some ridiculous stories. You know, mm-hmm. doctors could become, uh, if you want, what do they call nurse practitioners, for want of a better yeah. term, and, and go from there. But, no. Well... Oh well. Oh, no, yeah. A few years ago in Vancouver, I rented a house from a, 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 a doctor, a heart specialist, who would trained in Britain, and he was he was you know the very senior guy in his uh, in his speciality to the extent that he was coming over to Canada to give lectures to heart surgeons here about his particular techniques and specialities. While he was visiting here, he thought, "Oh, this is rather a nice place. I'd like to move here." So he moves to Canada. And, of course, he can't practice. So he's having to um, retrain from um, b- b- at the hands of people who he has come over to train in his speciality as a heart surgeon. Um, and then he has to go through, you know, he has to go and work four or five years out in the boonies somewhere before he finally gets back to, uh, to Vancouver and to uh, uh, the, uh, the general hospital there to be able to... Uh, to perform his, his particular skills. And I've heard so many stories like that from, uh, I know of one eye surgeon um, who, uh, he came from uh, from uh, Chile, but he was the world's, uh, spec- uh, he was the world's expert on a particular uh, eye operation. He'd written textbooks about it. He came here um, again to, to teach his speciality uh, and one decided to move here. Um, and he wound up actually spending a year or two as a janitor in the hospital while he was, you know, trained by the people who he had trained because he was the expert, world expert in this particular uh, aspect of eye surgery. So, you know, we, we, it's utterly dumb stuff, it really is. So what's the answer to all of this? Is there an, an answer in a nutshell that we can get uh, democracy back on track in Canada? Well, there's not an answer in a nutshell, uh, Dennis. I think there are a lot of things we have to do. As I said, I, you know, I, I put a lot of responsibility 
for uh, the uh, the neglect of democracy at the hands of the political parties. I think that they really need to get their act together um, and uh, uh, to realise that um, if uh, if they don't uh, if they don't uh, um, uh, take their responsibilities, that we're going to find ourselves in the hands of populists as as some other uh, countries have. Um, we've already seen sort of inklings of, of populist risings in um, in uh, in Ontario and in Quebec and uh, various other places, um, and. Um, uh, I think that also, we, you know, we individually have a responsibility to make our feelings known. But I don't think that there's there's any single uh, thing that could be done. One of the things that occurred to me, you know, is that um, uh, when I was starting out uh, as a political reporter, um, it was just after, of course, the, um, um, the, the, the centenary of Confederation, and I was working in Ontario, and... Uh, John Robarts, the then premier of Ontario, who was a, it was a, he was a fine man. He was a, you know, he was an Ontario loyalist, but he was also a Canadian statesman. He um, initiated a thing called the Confederation of Tomorrow Conferences, um, when you know a lot of the great and the good and ordinary people um, sat around and, and looked at the state of Canada in in nineteen it was nineteen sixty eight sixty nine. Uh, those conferences were on, um, and um, and they drew up a, 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 a sort of game plan for the future. Now, you know, this might be a good moment to have um, have another Confederation of Tomorrow conference and bring together people from, obviously, um, uh, federal politics, but also provincial politics and also municipal politics. And then people from outside, you know, um, people in business, uh, people in the arts, people in uh, academia, and... Um, uh, and and really have a, a good hard look at the state of Canada now, the state of Canadian democracy, the state of Canadian administration, um, and and have a and of course you know I mean relations with minorities which are very uh, uh, very much top of the agenda these uh, these days and and put that all together and let's let's examine ourselves let's go through a a, a bit of um, of self examination and uh, and see what we can produce so um I, oh, I, it, it could turn of course just into a talking shop but um but if with a bit of thought and a bit of planning and a bit of um uh, of, of care in selecting who takes part i think a, a new confederation of tomorrow conference might not be a bad idea well, we'll certainly press for that from our end, if mm. we can. Mm. We're talking with Jonathan Manthorpe, and the book mm. is Restoring Democracy. Now, before this, a couple of years earlier, though, you had mm. Claws of the Panda. Um, right. Are you worrying? Are we, uh, are we going to be uh, overtaken by Chinese uh, influences in the not-too-distant no. future? No. Uh, no, but, and let me say just then it's one one thing sort of before we talk about that. Then I think it's very very important. You know, we have in Canada uh, one and a half million Canadians who are one way or another of of ethnic Chinese heritage. Um, our problem is not with China. Our problem is with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese Communist Party is not the Chinese people, and the People's Republic of China is not China. We, I, we have to be very, very clear about that, because um, I would not have written the book if I'd uh, thought uh, that it might cause any dissension or any divisions within Canadian society, or if it might be used to uh, pillory uh, Canadians of Chinese heritage. Um, I, I, I would have. I would have, in fact, I, I talked to many of my uh, uh, Canadian friends of Chinese heritage, and before I uh, even sat down to write the book, I would not have done it if I thought that would happen. We have a problem with the Chinese Communist Party. That is for sure. You know, and at the moment we we have the biggest crisis in relations with the People's Republic of China that we've had since. Um, since uh, diplomatic relations were established in 1970, we have the Huawei affair. We, we have um, uh, um, the uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou, the uh, Huawei chief financial officer, is uh, under house arrest here, awaiting a, a ruling on a deportation order to the U.S. And uh, the Chinese Communist Party has responded by taking hostage two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, um, which. 
you know, it, to a certain extent, uh, is a good thing, uh, even though they've now been in, in solitary confinement for nearly 700 days. But that shows us exactly what sort of regime we're dealing with here. And we've fooled ourselves for far too long about, um, uh, uh, about kidding ourselves that we have a special relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. We don't. We don't. And uh, you, how do you deal with any political party whose first reaction when there is a, a hiccup in the relations is to take hostages. We can't deal with them in any reasonable way. Now, you know, here's the Saskatchewan aspect of the story, because, you know, you'll remember that one of the, another of the first things that the Chinese Communist Party did um, after uh, Meng Wanzhou was detained was to, to slap some sort of uh, um, um, embargo on Saskatchewan pork. Right. On meat. Right. Now, you know, uh, I was called by uh, CBC uh, in, uh, in Regina, and, they, and I did a bit of research before talking to them. And, uh, you know, the question was, well, you know, what do we do? Because um, uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, is our largest market for pork. Uh, well, it is. That's true. But in value, in value, Japan is your largest market. We sell, in terms of dollars, um, the, we, we sell more to Japan because the Japanese buy higher quality stuff. Um, so uh, that's an important, uh, it's an important story because it shows you, shows all of us, that there are actually better ways of dealing, uh, of, of, of arranging Canada's relationship with, with Asia. Everybody gets, uh, has been mesmerized by this notion of of, of uh, the PRC is this huge market of 1.3, 1.4 billion people. Um, well, you're never going to get into that in any serious way. Uh, it is much better, in my view, for Canada to be dealing with middle power democracies in Asia, such as Japan, such as South Korea, such as Taiwan, such as Indonesia, and of course Australia, New Zealand, and and you know and other countries of of Southeast Asia, such as Malaysia, um, and Thailand, and so on and so forth. Those are our natural partners in Asia, not uh, the People's Republic of China. It's too big for us to be able to have any um, uh, a, a serious uh, economic uh, impact on on that market, and also. The nature of the regime is such as you either play by their rules or you don't play at all. And if there's any problems, they take hostages. Uh, they share none of our values. They don't share our civic values. They don't share our human rights values. They don't share our, our um, any security values with us. They don't share our, our views of, on international institutions. Um, uh, uh, like the UN or any of the uh, or the law of the sea or any of these things, whereas the other countries of Asia do, and those are, uh, those are the countries we should be dealing with. You know, for example, if if instead of um, um, the the uh, the US uh, uh, extradition requests uh, being uh, for uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou and a Chinese company, if it had been say for a senior executive or a Japanese or a South Korean company. Um, all right, there would have been some friction in relations, but nothing like this because we share so many other values with Japan and with South Korea and with Taiwan and uh, other countries of Asia. And, and that cushions the blow when you, when you have a problem. But, uh, but uh, what, what the whole Huawei affair has shown is that we share nothing with the People's Republic of China or with the Chinese Communist Party except a pretty crude uh, trade relationship. And um, it, it was a wake-up call, and I think it was a wake-up call that was long overdue. And to, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm appalled by what's been done to the two Michaels, because as well as being detained, they've been tortured and they've been denied consular access and all sorts of other things. But it is an absolute wake-up call to us that we should be uh, drastically rearranging our trade relationship with Asia. Now, is there any way uh, out as it were, for the two, two Michaels in the in the short term, I don't know. Nope. I don't think so. I'm afraid. Um, you know, we'll, they, their fate depends on what happens to Meng Wanzhou and and the and the Canadian legal system. And I, you know, and to a, a significant degree, I am 
I, I, I accept that we have to let the legal system run its course and it has to be an independent judicial um, decision. And part of that, of course, is because you know, Canada has to show the world in this situation that we believe in the rule of law, that we stand by the rule of law, and more than that, that when we sign an international treaty, that we stand by it, that our word can be depended on. And I'm sure, you know, if we short-circuited this thing, um, uh, it, uh, uh, everybody who's got a, a treaty relationship with Canada would look at it and say, oh, well, you know, uh, we have to remember that uh, if we have any treaty problems with Canada, they're going to short-circuit it in their own interest if we're not careful. Um, so, you know, I think this is a very, very important moment for Canada, not least because I think... Uh, as much as the Huawei affair is a problem between us and People's Republic of China, it's also a problem between us and the United States of America. You know, we've been hung out to dry by the Trump regime on this thing. Oh, no um, kidding. <laughs> and, uh, and we have to, another lesson of this is, is not that we can't deal with, with, not only that we can't deal with People's Republic of China, but, it's, but, but, but also that uh, we can no longer depend on Washington and the United States to have our back the way we have since the Second World War. So, you know, the, uh, the internal frictions in the U.S. are now such that, uh, that uh, we would risk being uh, collateral damage uh, in, in whatever... Uh, is going on in that country, and it's often difficult to tell. But uh, you know, it's going to hell in a handcart at the moment. The way things look. <laughs> now, so the answer for Canada then, without getting too simplistic, would be to perhaps develop more of these uh, middle power yep. relationships, spread things around, and don't worry too much yep. about the big guys. That's right. Um, you know, we've got one at hand in in Asia, which has been my focus for the last few years. There's the the new Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is Canada and 11 other countries, most of them uh, middle power democracies, not all of them. There's Vietnam in there and things. But, you know, we should be um, we should be inviting, for example, Taiwan to join that. Taiwan's a, 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 a one of the most vigorous democracies in the world, and it's got uh, a, an incredible uh, economy uh, for, you know, there's 23 million people there, and they've, I think, got the 12th largest economy in the world. Um, and, you know, and they are also, uh, they show uh, quite conclusively, as indeed does South Korea and Japan, that you can be a Confucian society and still be, uh, still be a democracy. So, um, uh, you know, we should, we should be leaning on that, and we should also be, we, we've already got a good load of free trade agreements with um, countries of, of Latin America, uh, several of which are very vibrant democracies, such as uh, Chile and Colombia is coming along, and, and several other of them are doing uh, doing pretty well. Um, and of course, we've also got a very good free trade agreement with Europe, um, which is the envy of many others. I mean, indeed, Britain, as it leaves Europe, is trying to get the same deal with the European Union that Canada got. So, you know, we, we we we're doing okay, but we we need, I think, to put more more of our shoulder behind developing these uh, relationships, not just as trade relationships, but as political relationships. Um, and uh, you know, uh, that's that's the way we've got to go because the 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 balance of power in the world is changing. Uh, the U.S. is not going to be the overriding uh, superpower for all that much longer. Um, the, within the next 20, 30 years, uh, its economy, it's, al the, it's already the second largest economy in the world after the People's Republic of China. India is going to overtake the U.S. fairly shortly. Um, and uh, as we've seen, the, the U.S. doesn't have much interest anymore in, in the international organizations that it founded after the Second World War, like the U.N., like the International Monetary Fund, like the World Bank, like NATO. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, Canada, we need to really get our shoulders behind um, developing our relationships with other middle power democracies. Jonathan Manthorpe with us today, uh, Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and Pestilence. Um, is there an elevator pitch that you would hope people would take away from your book when they read it? 
Well, not an elevator pitch as such. I mean, the uh, a lot of it is is a, a, well, about half of it is a description of what I think's gone wrong in the last thirty years since the end of the Cold War. But then uh, the last half, there are a lot of selection uh, of suggestions in there, and I discuss some of the alternatives. But I really. I, I didn't uh, aim to set out a template for people about, you know, this is how we save democracy, because, uh, I mean, it's impossible to do that, um, and I wouldn't even try. But I wanted to start discussion on on various issues, and, and hopefully it will achieve that. To, uh, hopefully it will stimulate people. You know, I mean, there's a very basic one we have here in Canada. Should we switch to a proportional representation system, for example, at both the provincial and the federal levels. I came to the conclusion we shouldn't. Um, but there are a lot of people around who are really adamantly committed to, uh, to uh, a proportional representation system and think the, the, that that's the way we should go. You know, we should be having a good open debate about that. Um, it's an important issue. Uh, I mean, the reason I... I I felt that it's it's not the way to go. That our the reason I felt that our first past the post system is better is that I looked very closely at um, all the countries of, of the European Union that have proportional representation, um, and uh, two things. Well, two. There were many that stood out. One was that uh, even though many of these minority groups that often feel un underrepresented are represented in, under the proportional representation system in Parliament, overall, uh, the uh, uh, voters' confidence in these um, proportional representation parliaments hadn't risen at all. And part of, the, I think, the reason of that for that is that under proportional representation, um, you don't have an MP or an uh, a MLA in the same way, you know, representing your district. In the, somebody you can get on the phone and bark at when things go wrong. Right. In the, in the way that you do with, with uh, first past the post. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they become, in my view, more of a sort of isolated professional political class than they are already, and we don't want to go down that road. Uh, the other one is, of course, that um, uh, a lot of the uh, underproportional representation, it's much easier for crazy extremists, many of whom don't believe in democracy at all, it's much easier for them to get into into Parliament or into legislatures. And if you look at Europe, um, pretty well all the parliaments and a lot of the, the, the states that have their own legislatures, such as in Germany, I mean, have these... Uh, these extremist crazies uh, as members, um, even though these people don't believe in democracy at all. And in some cases, uh, because of proportional representation and the need to create sort of governing coalitions, because nobody wins a majority ever, um, these, uh, the crazies are part of the governing coalitions. Um, so I don't think that that's a very good idea at all. Um, and, of course, the other thing is that sometimes it can take months and even years to put together a government. I mean, Spain has had something like three or four elections in the last two years because they've never been able to form a government. Belgium, on one occasion, went for over a year and a half. I think it was 500 days, over 500 days, without a government at all because nobody could put one together. Um, that's not very healthy and not very useful. Um, so I, I, but then, you know, there, there are, uh, maybe you'll get some back chat on this because there are a lot of people who are passionate, believe, passionately oh, yeah. believe in, in PR and good for them. But uh, I think it's a debate we should have. All right. Well, that's a lot of my millennial friends are the, the uh, proportional representation crowd. Yep. And they're usually yep. attached to parties that have never won anything, so... <laughs> Well, yeah, but you know, uh, I, I, I think also in Canada because we're a, we're a, a confederation. Um, you know, everybody gets their 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 uh, everybody gets heard one way or another in the end. You know, they do. Um, so I, I I don't think we need it, and I think it would actually hobble our political system. Um, you know, we, you need you need a body that can actually make decisions, um, and. Um, uh, uh, you know, but every one of the, the, I guess, the virtues of of, uh, of proportional representation is that it uh, it, uh, 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 it encourages compromise. Um, 
but uh, sometimes at, at, at too high a cost. So uh, I, I've I've come down against it. But there we are. I, I, I appreciate that the arguments for it have some, or some of the arguments for it have some validity. But I just don't uh, buy the overall package. And there we have it, Jonathan Manthorpe. The latest book is Restoring Democracy in an Age of Populists and Pestilence uh, from Cormorant Books from Down East. I want to thank you very much for your time today, and now I have some things I can say to my proportional representation people when we have a discussion. So thank you very much. My pleasure, Dennis. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca.